All right, everyone. I think that we are going to go ahead and get started now. Um, so, um, can everyone hear me? Awesome. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, all right. So let's get started then. Um, welcome. I'm Kathleen Warshawski, um, and you are joining it joining us here at Choosing Your Decision Maker with um, 2020 Vision. So welcome, uh, we're glad that you made it. So I'm Kathleen Warschowski. Um, I've been a registered nurse for 29 years. Um, I started off at the bedside in nursing and then I transitioned into academia, uh, a little bit of research and um, and then I ran an orthopedic surgery practice for a while. I am currently the publisher of Seniors Blue Book of Greater Dallas. Um, I'm the Dallas chapter ambassador for Aging 2.0 in Dallas here. Um, I'm president of the Dallas Area Gerontological Society, and I am the founder of CareWorks. Um, I'm also on the board of elderly service providers and, of Collin County, and, uh, and I work with the Alzheimer's Association as well. Um, our next panelist today is Lori Miller. Lori is the owner and administrator of Apple Care and Companion. She is a Dallas uh, home care, she owns a Dallas home care agency. She's been an active member of the Dallas Area Genitological Society since 2006. She served two terms as president. Um, she founded the Conversation Ready North Texas and um, she is going to be telling us all kinds of good things a little bit later on. She is also um, getting her master's degree in gerontology and she's gonna graduate next month. Hi everybody, good to see you. And uh, next we have uh, Susan Rogers and Susan has been working with senior adults and their families for more than 25 years. She is the community liaison for elder law attorney, John McNair. Um, she provides all kinds of community and professional education on legal and aging related topics. She is the vice president of DEGS, the Dallas Area Gerontological Society, and she is active with all kinds of organizations. So the Alzheimer's Association, Compassion Fatigue Symposium, Down Syndrome Guild, and elderly service providers of Cullen County as well. Um, Susan, you want to say hello? Hello. Welcome, everybody. Awesome. All right, so our agenda today, we're gonna um, have our welcome, obviously, we just did that. We're gonna talk about who needs a decision maker, the importance of a decision maker, medical issues related to COVID-19, legal considerations, how to choose your decision maker, frequently asked legal questions, Susan's gonna help us with that one, and resources that are available to you. Right, but so we're first, gonna... <laughs> Already we messed up. Go ahead. No, you go ahead, Susan. Okay, um, I was just gonna say that we were gonna start off, and you're right, Lori, you were supposed to do it. <laughs> go ahead. So we're gonna start off with a little icebreaker um, just to get going. We know these are stressful times and um, unusual times. So the, what we want you to do in the chat box, um, it looks like a lot of you have found the chat box, but if you, can, if you can see it, what we'd love for you to do is type one word that you're feeling, one word to describe what is causing you concern right now. And we can just share from everybody. Tired, uncertainty. Anxiety, fear. New business is two words, Steve. <laughs> Discombobulated, good one, Cheryl. <laughs> she gets extra points for that. Yeah, the one long word, exhausted, strange. Mm -hmm. oh. Boredom, interesting. Overwhelmed, yeah. Stifled, that's a good one, Jeff. Uh-huh. 
it, there's a real range of feelings that we're experiencing. And sometimes I think my feelings change throughout the day. There are times when I feel like, okay, I've, I'm, I'm getting this together. And then at other times, it seems pretty overwhelming, chaotic. I agree. And, and when I did this before, what made me feel better is to see other people feeling the way that I was feeling, which was kind of that un uncertainty, that, that how I was. So the next question um, would be in the chat box also is, um, the next slide please, is write one word that right now that you're feeling that's giving you hope in this time of uncertainty. What is one word that's giving you hope right now? Faith, family, camaraderie, God, those are, yeah, faith, generosity, creativity, friends, innovation, that's a good one now, yeah, community. Sharing neighbors. When I had done this, I said togetherness, because it's it's interesting, even though we're far apart, as far we can be right now, but I, we kind of feel together in this, the whole thing together, partnerships, neighbors, sharing, friendship. Um, and I think when we are dealing with this, something so unusual as a pandemic, there there is something to give us hope. There has to be some sort of silver, silver lining. I know a lot of people were saying faith, and I think that's really um, togetherness or faith, however you feel. I think that's great. So should we? Awesome. Continue. OK, so the first question is, who needs a decision maker? Um, and really, everyone over 18 needs a decision maker. It's, we really need someone who, who can speak for us when we can't speak for ourselves. And um, for me, I first realized this when my daughter eight years ago or nine years ago now went off to college out of state. It didn't dawn on me until someone told me by the time she was a sophomore that if she were in an accident or was in the hospital, they didn't have to tell me anything. She didn't have any of her proper paperwork. She had no, and why would she? She just went off to college but no HIPAA release, no power of attorney assignment, and it freaked me out. Um, and it was really then, and actually I learned about it at a DAGS meeting to promote DAGS, but it was really then that I realized everybody needs a, a decision maker. Um, and especially now, it's so important because it's kind of in our face with this pandemic, and we really need to have someone who can speak for us if we can't speak for ourselves. Um, we, we need someone to know what we want, it, especially when we can't um, speak for ourselves. This illness goes very fast, and so it could be too late to just start the conversation when someone is already ill. Um, and then, and this is also important, we need it, we all understand we need it, but we need to help our loved ones, our clients, our residents, um, patients, help them understand that they need a decision maker as well. <clears throat> and, and why, why do we need this decision maker? There's two, two big buckets of reasons why. One is this loss of control that people are feeling. Um, and those of you who don't feel that way, awesome. But you see all the people who are doing the toilet paper panic buying. And I think it is a, a reason to control something that they feel um, they need to control their situation. So first, I think it's important <clears throat> for everyone to realize we can control some things. We can control um, to the best of our ability, wearing masks and, and uh, abiding by social distancing and staying six feet away, washing our hands a lot and um, disinfecting more things than maybe we would, but also having this difficult conversation is also another way to give us control. It's, it's really important and that is something that we can do to control our situation that, that is 
really un unknown, as many people said in the chat. It's just unknown. We don't know what's going to happen next. The other main big reason why we need to do this is we want to have the treatment at our, and when we're seriously ill or not have treatment, but we want what we want. And that's really important to express that to other people. So if we can't speak, they can speak for us. And just as important is for our loved ones to get what they want or not get the kind of care that what they, what they want. There have been studies that have shown if there is no decision maker in place out of emotion or out of guilt, people will choose more. They'll choose more intervention because it's too difficult to, to say, no, no, let's stop now or let's not do that. But that may be exactly what your loved one or patient or resident wants. So even though it's very difficult and, and I think we all understand how difficult this is, it's way better to do it now um, and be prepared. I know when my, um, when I was a little girl and my grandmother would visit, she would always tell me every day, she would go, before I left the house for school, she said, make sure you have clean underwear on because what if you, what if you got an accident and then, you know, the doctor saw you or whatever it was, be prepared, be, be ready. Um, I'm one of those kind of people when my gas tank gets to a quarter tank, I have to fill up. I don't wait till it gets on empty. And I think right now um, in this pandemic, we need to be prepared. And I think you know, hopefully we won't need to use it. But if we do, we'll have our, our documents in place and our decision maker in place. Uh, do you want to do a poll right now, Lori, about documents? That would be wonderful. All right. So can everyone see a poll on your screen? If you, you can answer. Just give everyone a few minutes here or a few seconds to answer. We still have some numbers coming in. Mm -hmm. So while we're waiting for the numbers to come in, Lori, it's funny that you mentioned your grandmother's advice to always have new underwear on or something like that. Because when I was in college, I was actually hit by a car. And the whole way from when I was picked up by the ambulance to the medical center, all I kept saying in my shock or panic or whatever was, I'm wearing new underwear, I'm wearing new <laughs> underwear. And so it's funny that you said that, but I felt so prepared. <laughs> I had followed your grandmother's advice. She would have been so proud. Yes. All right. So I'm gonna end the poll and show the results here to everyone. Okay, very interesting. Yeah. So, this crowd is, is pretty good, um, I think pretty high numbers, but we are pretty much preaching to the choir, but that doesn't always happen. So we, I think we still have a lot of work to do. Um, and hopefully by the end, you'll, those that don't, the other percentage that don't have some of these documents will, will see the reason to have them after this. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, how would you like to have one more poll about having the conversation? That I would love to, to see. Perfect. Okay, there's another poll. I have the uh, conversation with my family constantly, and uh, I think it drives them crazy, actually, um, because I talk about it so much. Um, it doesn't matter what we're doing. I'm constantly telling my husband, you know, you know, when I'm old and I'm in the nursing home and they want me to put on shoes, don't let them make me put on shoes because I just want to wear my happy socks. That's what I wear. <laughs> And then I make sure he knows what happy socks are because otherwise he'll just put on any old socks on me. And that's just not the same, right? I want the soft, fluffy, warm ones, preferably that have like some aloe in them or something. And so anyways, um, yeah, I'm constantly having the conversation. All right, let's check out these results. 
So that's, these are also off, off the chart, good numbers. This is a great crowd that we have here. So I think our goal is also to um, help others. I think we probably have a pretty professional crowd on here and how we can help others, whether it's our, our residents, our patients. I think it's interesting because people are um, secluded and quarantined and alone and they may not have family that they can talk to right now, face-to-face um, -face or in person, there's other ways, but it's really important that we do our best to help, to help everybody, not just older adults. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So next we're going to talk about um, the impact that COVID-19 is having on everyone. Um, according to the World Health Organization, 80% uh, of people with COVID-19 are recovering without needing hospital treatment, which I think is great. However, one out of every six patients become seriously ill and can develop breathing prob problems or other problems that are needing hospitalization. In the severe cases, the virus is causing damage to their lungs. Their uh, immune system detects it and is expanding blood vessels. So um, so that more immune cells can enter. This is causing fluid to enter the lungs, making it harder to breathe, and it results in the oxygen levels um, in the body decreasing. And therefore, people are having to go on ventilators or get oxygen support when they go to the hospital. Um, it's impacting all ages. There's a quick de decline. Um, people who are going to the hospital are getting isolated, which um, is really not a great thing. Um, in some of the information that I have, um, it says that um, patients who have coronavirus are needing more time on ventilators. The average is 10 days, according to the University of Washington study. Um, other reports say it's two weeks. Um, the typical ICU patient that doesn't have COVID only requires three to seven days. So um, they're seeing a huge increase in the amount of ventilator support that's being needed um, with this disease. Um, some some uh, statistical things. This is the distribution of cases. Um, currently, in the uh, this data was uh, found yesterday. I, I compiled it yesterday. So um, the United States has uh, 644,000, almost 645,000 cases. Um, the U.S. has actually um, has the highest number of known cases in the world now. It exploded in the last six weeks. Um, you can see that Spain and Italy also have a large number of cases. And then some of the smaller countries, you know, their population is smaller. So that um, is part of the reason why they don't have as many cases. Um, and the source of all this data is down here um, so that you can see where I got it from. And um, I will be making the presentation available later for everyone. And those links are live. So you can actually just click on the links once you have the presentation. Susan, you had a question? Yes, I was just gonna add, these are reported cases. And so if you have areas where testing has not been widespread, these are probably way under counts. Correct. Um, and that, we're gonna talk about that in, um, when we get to the unknowns, but um, you know, under reporting of the cases is a huge problem worldwide. Um, here in the US, you know, there's a lot of people that you know have been wanting to be tested and they're not getting tested. There's just not enough equipment available to, attest, to test them and not enough tests available as well. Um, fatality rates by age. Um, I thought this was kind of an interesting slide. Um, this one shows South Korea, Spain, China, and I Italy. And it was um, compiled from our world in data.org. Um, and it's it talks about the risks of dying from COVID-19. And so when you look at this, you can see that it's not just the, you know, over 65 population that's dying from it. Every country is a little bit different. Um, and, you know, I don't know if that has anything to do with um, how they're testing or if it has to do with the medical care that they have there. I think that a lot of that remains to be seen. You know, China's numbers might be a little bit higher in some areas because they were hit first. And so the treatment regimen wasn't as good. Here in the US, we've had the benefit of having it hit 
over in Italy really hard before it hit here in China really hard. And so we've had those expertises be able to share what worked for them and what didn't work for them. And so we have the opportunity to have a better outcome. Um, this slide I thought was also interesting. It shows um, in the world the share of the population that is over the age of 70. Um, and this data is from 2015. So um, I guess that's the, the best they could do as far as that goes. But when you look at that, you can see Italy has uh, a really older, older aged population. Um, and you can see that the US, we have a fairly um, robust over 70 year old population as well. And you would expect that areas that have the older adults in them would get hit harder. This slide is was actually um, updated today. Um, this is the data that's from um, the Texas Department of Health. And this shows uh, Texas, all of Texas, and you can see the uh, Harris County is being hit the hardest here in Texas. Dallas County is second. Tarrant, um, Collin County is down there at 494 cases reported today. And again, that's only confirmed testing, tested cases. Um, and Denton County is at 547. Um, you can see the fatalities in Texas is 393 today. Um, and they estimate that 3,600 patients have um, have actually recovered from the virus, which is great. Um, it also shows you the total tests that have been done to date and how many of them were done um, in public labs and private labs. So there's some really great information out there and we're getting more and more information every day. There is a, a website that gives you information on obtaining data in the Dallas area in Dallas County by zip code. You can see the number of cases. I didn't share that um, just because um, that's not really the, the reason for our presentation today. Um, this slide again shows um, in 14 states, it shows lab confirmed coronavirus cases for 2019 and their associated hospital rates. So you can see um, that people between the ages of 18 and 49 are being hospitalized. People in their 50s and 60s are being hospitalized. So it's not just a disease of older adults that's affecting them and making them truly ill. Um, I don't know, can you all see my cursor when I move it? Um, if you can, you can see that this graph is showing all of this per um, 100,000 population. And this is showing the over 65. So you can see that although younger ages are being um, hospitalized with the disease, it's truly um, hitting the older adults a lot harder. Um, again, this slide is from World of Meters and uh, it's taking data from New York City Health Department and this is current as of April 14th. And again, this one's showing you the share of deaths. So it's showing you um, again from New York City, um, the number of deaths um, in each age category. And it also shows you if they had underlying health conditions or com comorbidities, or if they didn't have any. And so I think uh, one of the things that's concerning to all of us is that there are healthy people who are dying from it. Um, and that makes it even more important that everyone, um, as soon as they're 18 years old, is starting to have the conversation. Um, another interesting piece um, was that over there in New York, you can see that of those deaths, 61% of them were male and 38% were female. Um, and so I think it will be interesting to see um, US wide what that data looks like and then to have it further dissected into why are more men in the US dying than, than females. And there's data from other places that I that I looked up and every country's data is different and their statistics are different. And so just because here in New York, there's more men than women doesn't mean that it's worldwide that way. This is also local Texas data. And this is showing you here in Texas how it's affecting um, the different age groups as well as different ethnicity groups. Um, and then the gender as well. So here in Texas, you can see that confirmed cases um, 
there's a fairly close correlation between males and females, um, but that's not talking about the death rate yet. And it's too soon and it's still unknown to know how that's affecting us here in Texas because we're several weeks behind New York. Um, you can see in the ethnicity, um, there's more white people who've been affected, but the um, I think the Hispanic population here in the Dallas area is also being hit really hard. And there was, um, Lori shared some information with us about that earlier. Um, they're talking about poverty, obesity, diabetes, and other comorbidities in South Dallas and the seriousness of the effects of COVID on those areas and, and um, how it's affecting them. And then Additionally, um, we received some information about how in Dallas, those who test positive for the virus have a 30% chance of ending up in the hospital compared to, or, and that of those 30% who are in the hospital, over a third of them will end up in critical care, according to Dallas County data. Um, and again, I think it's important for us to remember that those percentages, the 30% who test positive, it's not everyone who's had coronavirus because there's a lot that are not getting tested. Um, and so I think that's really important. They have to be sick enough to be tested. I think the criteria um, for most places is still you have to have fever of a certain temperature in order to be tested. So um, that's important to know too. Um, want to talk a little bit about co comorbidities in the disease. So this slide is showing you um, that um, the US population, that's the orange part. These are the number of people in the US, either with or without COVID-19, who actually have these comorbidities. So hypertension, 61% of people in the US have hypertension. The blue is not US data. The blue is actually data from Italy and it's from the people who were hospitalized, the 1,100 deaths in Italy that were hospitalized that happened and the comorbidities that they had. Um, and so I thought that was really interesting too. And then a few other things that I wanna share with you all um, is some of the unknown. So if someone is infected with COVID-19, how likely is it that they will die? And the answer to that question is captured by the infection fatality rate. To work out the infection fatality rate, we need to know two numbers. One, the total number of cases, and two, the total number of deaths. The problem is we don't know the total number of cases because so many people are not being tested. And so we can't actually give correct information when it comes to that. Um, additionally, with comorbidities, um, they initially were saying that if you had a BMI of greater than 40, you are at high risk. They're now today saying that if your BMI is over 30, that makes you at more high risk. Um, and so I think that's a big number for, for us to understand too. Um, according to covid.net, um, approximately 90% of hospitalized patients identified through them had one or more underlying conditions, the most common being obesity, hypertension, chronic lung disease, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. More than 40% of COVID-19 patients developed ARDS. Um, and that was in a March 13th study from the Journal of American Medical Association. Um, and that's with US data, that statistic there. Um, the Intensive Care National Audit and Research Center in the UK reported that 66% of patients on ventilators died. Um, a University of Washington medical study published on March 30th noted that nine of their 18 patients died. Um, they're also saying that if you go on a ventilator, there's a 20% chance that you will survive. Um, so I think that, that there's a lot going on right now, a lot of unknown and um, there's a lot of good data out there and there's a lot of not so great data out there. So try and make sure that when you're looking for data, you're looking from a reliable source as well. Um, and I think, oh, one other thing I wanna talk about is that the deadliest outbreaks in the US have been in nursing homes and other long-term care facilities. And I think they found the same thing over in Italy. And now onto something better. 
So Kathleen and Lori have done a really excellent job in pointing out why in at any time we need to have the conversation and we need to have our documents in order. And then Kathleen has really hit home, I think, with um, these statistics to show that yes, our senior adults, our adults who have comorbidities are certainly at higher risk, but that we're all at risk. And we just never know with the rapid progression of the disease, we could feel fine today. And in a day or so, we could find ourselves in the hospital um, and maybe unable to speak for ourselves if we're heavily sedated, if we're on a ventilator in those kind of conditions um, and isolated from our families. And so what can we do about that? What can we do for ourselves? Ourselves, what can we do for our family members and what can we do for our clients um, and residents, patients, whatever you call them. Um, so let's talk about a few legal considerations. Uh, we generally refer to someone who's legally appointed to be your decision maker as an agent. So that could be someone who's been appointed guardian. Um, it could be a trustee in certain cases. It could be a surrogate decision maker. But typically what we're talking about today is a power of attorney for healthcare. Um, are the agents and the alternate agents you've selected available and willing to act? So that's two, two separate considerations there. So are they available? Um, with this COVID-19, we're, you know, most of us are self-isolating. We're here at home with our spouse, our close family members. And it's possible that those very people that we were counting on to be our decision maker may be confined here in the house with us. And so let's say I have appointed my husband to be my agent under a power of attorney and he's appointed me. Well, what if I get sick and I get him sick and we both end up in the hospital? So it's important that not only that I have agent, an agent who's been appointed, but that also I have alternates. Um, and not only that um, they're available to act, meaning they can get on the phone, they're not you know, working in an ER somewhere 22 hours a day where they're not able to take a call or whatnot, um, but they're available and that they're also willing to act. So that can be tricky too because um, not everybody wants that responsibility, especially when we're talking about circumstances where, you know, the person that you love the most may be now on a ventilator and are you, and you may have to decide do we continue that treatment? Do we withdraw that treatment? Do we even start that treatment to begin with? And, and what are, the, what are those pers that person's wishes? Um, so we wanna be sure you know, that we have both of those things checked. Um, do they know your wishes? So, so in our poll earlier, many of us um, marked that we had had the conversation or a conversation or in Kathleen's um, circumstance, many conversations with our family about our wishes, but have we had those conversations with the alternate agents? And we have we had those conversations since this COVID-19 pandemic has come about when our risks for intubation um, may be higher um, and where intubation may be something that, you know, before this, whenever I thought, and I'm not a nurse or a doctor, but when I thought about needing to be intubated, I would think that would be a circumstance like maybe I'd had a catastrophic car accident or a major, major stroke or something like that where I had brain damage. And because of that, I was needing the artificial respiration. Um, now with this disease, it's not that cognitively or a brain injury, it's because of the function of the lungs. And so that to me is a different consideration and it may be to you. And if it is, then it's important that your, that your decision makers know um, that you may decide one way if you're affected by the COVID-19 virus and you may decide a different way if it's a different condition where you may be looking at long-term brain damage and long-term ventilator um, use. So make sure that you've had those conversations um, um, recently. 
And then do your agents have copies of your documents readily available? We don't want them to have to dig through somewhere they might not be able to access. You know, if you are the decision maker for someone who's living in an assisted living community and they go into the hospital and you don't have a copy of their documents, you're not maybe gonna be able to access that community to rifle through their files and find that information that you need. So make sure that you have copies of your own documents and that your agents also have um, copies of those documents as well. So that'll be really important. Uh, the other thing to consider is, um, you know, every time you go to the doctor or any medical provider, they have you fill out a HIPAA authorization form specific to that hospital or doctor's office or medical practice. And that's great. And we want to have that, but you may not be in a position to be able to sign that. Um, so it can be really important to have what we call a general HIPAA authorization, which is a document that is valid anywhere you go, not just in that one specific office. And so with a general HIPAA authorization, you can name a number of people that, you're, that you give permission for the healthcare providers to speak to. Um, and that way, if the one agent that you're relying on as your medical power of attorney is not available or not willing or not able to act, they have other people that they can talk to and they can get that information to them so that they can make decisions if you're not able to. Um, okay, Kathleen, can you? There is a slide? question that I wanted you to address before oh, we move yes. on. So okay. someone is asking if all this was done in another state, does this go with you anywhere? That's a great question. It's actually one we get a lot. Um, we, we have it on another slide, but I can talk about it here as well. Um, so if you make a power of attorney, whether it's for healthcare, a financial power of attorney, you write a living will and you've done it in a different state, um, it's absolutely legal here in Texas. Um, the, the thing that I would be more concerned about is less about the, the healthcare power of attorney, but more with a financial power of attorney, which can also be an issue at these times. The durable financial power of attorney, so for a financial power of attorney, you wanna make sure it says durable, not springing. Um, if it's springing, it only goes into effect if the person's incapacitated, which is when we're talking about acting. But the problem is with that is you have to prove that that person is incapacitated. And it just provides a barrier to the financial institution or bank who may say, I don't want to mess with that. I'm not going to accept your authority as an agent under a power of attorney because I don't, I don't. I don't get your proof of this person's incapacity. So that's the first thing to look for is one, to make sure that it's a durable financial power of attorney. The second thing to consider is that the, the power of the financial power of attorney is its ability to convince a bank or financial institution to, to allow your agent to act on your behalf. And if it's on an older form, if it's a copy of a copy, if it's um, not in a form that they're familiar with, if we're having to use an alternate agent, those are all reasons why a bank or financial institution may say, mm, we're not, we're, we're going to need more documentation in order for us to, to, to um, recognize your authority as a decision maker. So best case scenario is you would have a recently completed Texas version of the form because that's what banks and financial institutions in Texas are most used to seeing. But the answer is that yes, any anywhere that it's been, um, that it, it's, it what, doesn't matter what state it is, you cross the state lines, it doesn't matter, it's still valid. You still may have more trouble with it, especially in the financial sense, if it's not a current Texas form. Again, it's less important for the medical power of attorney than it is for the financial, but that's a great question. Was awesome. there another? Nope, that's, that was our question for now, thank you. Okay, super. Okay, so how to choose a decision maker. Um, one of the hardest things that I've seen is for decision makers, it's a lot of responsibility. Um, 
to make these types of decisions, especially if you're not quite sure what someone's wishes are. So as you're thinking about who you would trust to follow your wishes, you need to consider that they may have to go against what the doctor's saying. They may have to go against what other family members are saying. So you may think that, oh, my spouse or my sister or my whoever is gonna be the best person to make a decision on your behalf. But if they're not able to stand up um, to the doctor or to um, your other family members and really advocate for you, then they might not be the best alternative in that case. Um, so for example, care setting. We have a lot of people now um, maybe who are coming out of the hospital earlier than maybe they were before COVID-19. And so they have the option, do they go home? Do they go into a skilled nursing facility? Do they go into a rehab hospital? Do they go into an assisted living with supportive care? Do they go home with home care? So there's a lot of decisions there. And the doctor may be advocating one route. Maybe they're saying, oh, they need to go into a rehab hospital or skilled nursing. But maybe that the individuals would have said, no, I would rather go home. I want to stay home. Um, and so you need someone who's going to be able to advocate for what your wishes are. And, and not everybody wants to or can do that. So that's a consideration. Um, we talked about discussing your wishes with your decision makers. And so as you're choosing who's going to be your decision maker and you're talking about these issues, if the person um, negates your feelings or your choices um, or doesn't seem comfortable about talking about it with you ahead of time, they may not be comfortable talking about these types of things and making these decisions in a crisis situation. So that might be um, something that might uh, influence your decision of who to choose. Then it's also important um, once you've decided who you want your agent to be and you've identified maybe some alternate agents, you need to let them all know who each other, who they all are, right? So that um, they can communicate if they need to, so that there's no hard feelings. Um, if you've chosen, you know, one child to, to be the healthcare power of attorney, um, you want the other siblings, if they are there, to understand why that person was chosen and why this person was chosen as an alternate, et cetera. Um, so I think the question about um, having the, the documents from out of state uh, brings up the question of, you know, what, where can I get these forms? How much is it going to cost? What's it, how long is it going to take to get them? Can I even get them signed at a time like this when we're social distancing. So ideally you would have documents that were drafted by an elder law attorney um, or an estate planning attorney, someone who has specialization in this area. But in this crisis situation, it's better to have something than not to have something. And so the state of Texas, and we're gonna show you the link for this um, in another slide, but the state of Texas has forms that are available, that are widely used, and can be downloaded right off the internet. Now, um, they need either witnesses or notary, um, and we'll talk about that as well, but that is something that is possible to be done um, remotely now in Texas just during this crisis. Um, and the other point um, that Lori had actually brought up in a conversation we had was that it might be that now things are more on people's mind. Um, and I think we all think of, oh, I want to sit down over a nice cup of coffee and sit in this nice, warm, loving environment and have this deep conversation with my loved ones about my wishes. And that's kind of this idealized version of, of this conversation. Um, and so now to think about, okay, well, I might have to do it over the phone or I might have to do it over a, a video call or something like that. Maybe that wasn't ideal, but in some ways it can kind of make it a little bit easier because you're not in that room and feeling all that emotion. Um, so it's um, just a different way to do it and it might be an opportunity to make it a little bit easier now. Um, awesome. Okay. 
Um, I want to go ahead and do another poll. Um, this one is um, all about why, why each of you are attending today's uh, webinar. And while you are taking the poll, if I could just share a little bit of information about um, at the end of today, um, there should pop up a survey on your screen and uh, it's from SurveyMonkey. If it doesn't pop up on your screens, you will receive it via email. So if you would please take that survey um, and so that we can compile the data to prepare for other programs. Additionally, those of you who need the continuing education credit or a certificate of attendance, it is mandatory for you to do that survey in order to get that certificate. Um, so make sure that you um, do pay attention to it and take it, and then your certificates will be emailed to you um, should you be requiring one. All right, and let's see our poll results. Hmm. So interesting. So 72% of you are here for yourself, 60% for a loved one, and then um, just a sprinkle here for um, to help your patients, clients, residents, and other people. Mm -hmm. So that's awesome. Yeah. So I love that, um, you know, that saying about if you're on an airplane and they lose cabin pressure, you put your own masks on first and then you help others, right? So we all need to make sure we have our own ducks in a row and then we'll be able to help other people as well. So here are some of the frequently asked questions that we get. Um, so one is, does a decision maker have to be a family member? And the question is absolutely not. It is whoever you choose and whoever you trust and whoever you think you're most comfortable with to make these kind of decisions. Now, if you don't have a medical power of attorney and you're hospitalized, you're unconscious or you're intubated, you're not able to talk for yourself, um, there is a protocol and procedure according to law of what the physician will do and how they'll make decisions. And so they would look first to a spouse. The spouse wasn't available. They would look to adult children. And if adult children weren't available, they'd look to your parents, if your parents are still with us. And then lastly, they would look to any, what they call nearest living relative, um, which probably could be interpreted several ways, um, but then that person would make the decision in, a in, in cooperation with your physician as well. Um, if there was no family at all, then the physicians, they would have um, a panel usually that would help decide, like an ethics panel to help decide the course of, of treatment if the patient wasn't able to speak for themselves. Um, Question two, can I name both children to be my decision maker? So I don't see this as much anymore, but for a while we were seeing um, powers of attorney that would name both kids or three kids sometimes equally to make decisions. And honestly, that just kind of defeats the whole purpose of it. Um, I mean, the idea is that you think about who would be the best person and maybe you make the others alternates, but um, you don't want there to be indecision and disagreement and whatnot. You want there to be able to be a quick and clear decision that can be made by the person that you have appointed to do that. So it can be done, but we don't recommend it. Um, do I need both a medical power of attorney and a living will or directive to physicians? So living will, directive to physicians are two names for the same document. Basically the medical power of attorney appoints a person for your doctor to talk to, to guide them as you make medical decisions or as they make medical decisions for you. And a living will or directive to physician puts on paper what your wishes are. So you, you don't need both, um, but it's best if you have both. Because again, we remember I talked about how hard a position it can be for that medical power of attorney to have to make decisions that may go against what other family members think or what go against what the doctor says or just that are really um, hard for them, heart-wrenching for them to make. If you've put your wishes down in writing 
on a living will or a directed physicians or through something a little less formal like using the conversation project or some of those resources if they have in writing what your wishes are that can really help give them confidence as they're making the decisions and so if there is disagreement among family and friends they can come back to that and say look this is the conversation we had this is what she wrote down I know that I'm acting as she would act if she was able to decide for herself. So best, uh, both is best. Um, are out of state documents valid in Texas? Good, we already talked about that one. How do I get my signature witnessed or notarized during social distancing? So um, some states have allowed um, remote notarization for some time. Texas is not one of those states. And so until April 9th, there was no way to get a document notarized unless you were physically in front of that notary with your witnesses. So on April 9th, Governor Abbott um, uh, released a, an addendum and said that he is allowing notarization via video conferencing. And this is specifically for self-proved wills, durable power of attorneys for financial matters, medical power of attorneys, and directives to physicians. So those documents there um, are allowed to be um, notarized uh, um, at a distance. And so what would happen is, let's say you would have the document, if, if I'm signing the document, um, I, I either the, I guess I would have the document, I would be on the video conference with the notary, the notary would, would verify my identity, would watch me sign, I would then um, either fax or email or electronically um, get that document to the notary who then would notarize it and sign it and either fax or electronically send it back to me. And then at that point, it would be a legal document. So that can be done, absolutely. Um, and this, um, this ability to do it remotely will go on as long as the disaster declaration um, goes on in Texas related to COVID-19. So we do have that opportunity to do that. Um, and then the last question that we get a lot is, can I change my current document to reflect my COVID-19 preferences and then change it back? So I think specifically we're talking here about um, if you have a living will or directive to physicians, and let's say you've said on that that you don't wish to have life prolonging interventions like to be put on a ventilator. Well, what if now you've reconsidered that in this case, and if you if this is your condition and you have COVID-19, you would like to try that out. Um, yes, you can change that in writing, but I think the more important thing and probably the more effective approach would be to have that conversation with your decision maker because your physician is gonna go to that decision maker versus looking up in your file what it said. If they've got someone there on the other end of the phone who says, you know, she and I talked about this and um, we do wanna go ahead and do um, go ahead and, and innovate her, put her on the ventilator. Let's see how this progresses. They're going to go with that. Um, so I think it's, I mean, yes, you could change things and change it back, but I think the more important thing would be to have that conversation with your decision makers. So thank you. Susan, we have another question for you as well. Great. Amanda is asking, I'm not quite sure how to word this. Does Texas use the five wishes advanced directive? Okay. Um, so you can use that. It's a useful tool. Um, it is not, it, it doesn't have any like legal power, if that makes sense. Um, so it will guide your family or your physician in making decisions about your care if you're not able to speak for yourself. But but there may be circumstances where you may have put something on paper and then the circumstances and the family and whatever decide something else. Um, so it's definitely helpful. Um, I think it's better than just having a living will because a living will generally says, yes, I want this, no, I don't want this. 
Whereas the five questions, it's going into a lot more detail and a lot more nuance. And I think it gives them a better idea because we can't predict every single circumstance that we're gonna run into. And so the more information you can give your decision makers about your, um, your feelings and your thoughts about the types of care that are available, the better they're gonna be able to make decisions. Thank you for that. Helps. And we are going to just take another poll right now. So give me one moment to launch that poll. Um, this next poll is gonna ask about social distancing. So it's something that we have all been asked to do by the state. And um, you see some people doing it, some people not doing it, some people doing it on different levels. Um, so just wondering, um, you know, of our attendees today, how many of you are social distancing and at what level are you social distancing? So we'll take a minute. Um, since we're talking about, well, I have my prop for the next piece. So I'll wait. Um, I personally am doing a lot of social distancing. Um, I am staying home. My husband's going to the grocery store. I do go outside and walk the dog though. Um, and we walk around the block and we go on some hiking trails. The hiking trails we go on are not paved trails. They're in the woods. And so we don't see anyone else. Um, so I would say um, that for myself, I'm home most of the time. I don't go to the grocery store, but, um, but I am walking the neighborhood. So I've been, I, I would be probably number two here, home most of the time, but go to the grocery store. Um, and when I do, I, I tend to wear something that I'm going to put right into the laundry when I get home. I do wear a mask. Um, I don't take my phone with me. I just take my credit card and put it in my pocket or whatever. Um, and then as soon as I get home, I undress um, and I get into the shower. And um, typically I'll have my husband or my oldest son will um, kind of wash down things that might have germs on him, take out packaging, and we throw away all the bags. I'm not, I, I used to be really good about using my reusable bags and not anymore. I just use the plastic bags and throw them away when we're done. Nice. So here's our, um, here's our statistics. So it looks like the majority of people are doing something very similar to what Susan and I are doing. There's a few people going to work. Um, and I will assume that they're all working uh, it, in the essential businesses. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just want you to know that I will pray for all of you who are still having to go to work. Um, and then I still have one more poll that I would love for you all to um, help us with. And it relates to um, wearing a mask. Mm. So I brought a handy dandy mask to the party so that you <laughs> all could see that I have one here. Um, and so, we walk around with them. Is this this one that you made, Kathleen? Kathleen yeah. did a really cool tutorial, a video tutorial mm -hmm. of making a mask out of a bandana. And I have used that several times. Thank you. You're welcome. It's actually really easy to do with uh, almost nothing, um, which is great. And I'm wearing them. Um, since I'm not going very far, I don't wear them very many places, but um, when I walk the dog and when I do go to um, to the hiking trail, I actually have one in my backpack for the dog um, and I take it with me just in case we happen to be in a cr more crowded area, so to speak, um, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, so far, we've never seen anyone on the hiking trail. <laughs> we go very early in the morning too. All right, so let's see. Um, so we have the majority are wearing them when they go to the store or when they leave the house. Um, and uh, only a few are wearing them when they're at work. Um, so I'll assume that those are the same people who said that they were working. Um, and uh, a few people are never wearing them. So thank you all for sharing that uh, with us. I'm really surprised when I go to the grocery store how many grocery store employees are not wearing their masks? Yes. Um, so, uh, so we do have some wonderful resources to share with you guys. 
and I've uploaded a lot of them on the Conversation Ready NTX website. And you'll see there's just a, a, a page that you can click to called resources. And I've added a lot. Um, the Vermont Ethics Network has some wonderful stuff for the community, but also for healthcare providers. So that's on there. The Center to Advance Palliative Care, COVID resources, I put that on there, they're awesome. Respecting Choices has a COVID-centered um, uh, center right now, so I put that on there. But the Conversation Project came out with a two-page guide specifically for COVID-19 that's really, really great. And I'll show you a, a sample in just a sec. Oh, I'll show it to you now. And um, this is, well, I won't. <laughs> Oh, it's just a sec, but there are, um, Kat, uh, Susan had mentioned a couple of, of websites that you can do online. So one of them is called Cake and it's joincake.com and the others is called mydirectives.com. And actually my directives is a local a guy here who started it. And they're online sources where you can fill out your forms and put them in a password coded system and it'll be in the web. You can have a have it on your phone. And I think both of them, you can even download a short video that you could have um, for people. So it's really nice. It's free. They're both free to the consumer. Um, those links are on there as well. Um, Kathleen's site, the Seniors Blue Book has some wonderful resources as well as educational events and what's going on um, <clears throat> for resources. And now if you want to hit the next slide. So the the conversation project guide for COVID-19, it's almost a really mini version of the starter kit. Um, on the first page, it just gives you kind of a one, two, three, how, what you can do right now and how you can help um, pick your healthcare decision maker. And then the second page is really nice. Um, if you're gonna go to the next slide. It asks a few questions and these are more soft and fuzzy than legal. Um, but it helps to get to the point. It helps the family member understand what you want. Like what would be most important to you in, if you were seriously ill? So it's not the general talk that we normally have when you're planning, but right now, as um, Susan had mentioned about the ventilator support, which is something um, that's different in this circumstance than normal. So when you answer these questions, it's right now in this pandemic, if you were seriously ill with COVID-19. So what's most important to you? What are you most worried about? Um, this is really interesting. So if someone was really worried about being alone and um, th then maybe if, if they had some of the other comorbidities, maybe they would choose not to go to the hospital because chances are if they're gonna go to the hospital and they're going to get seriously ill, most likely they will be put on a ventilator. And um, that's, it seems to be the course. So maybe, maybe it's taking that step and not even having going to the hospital or having treatment. That's really, really important to know. And then what is helping you get through this difficult time? And the, these little examples, my friends, my faith, my cat, you know, people's pets are very, very important to them. Maybe they would rather stay home um, and be with their animal or be in their own room or be in their own surroundings and try to try to make it through. And that is really the last thing they would want to do is go to a hospital and be alone and be in pain or be scared or, or whatever. So this is a, it's a two pager. It's really great. Again, you can download it. It's on a PDF form on the website and you can download it. You can email it, you can send it. But I think this is a great way to get um, the conversation started for this particular time period. Um, and if you have any questions, of course, um, always let us know, but I think these resources could be very, very helpful. Thank you. Kathleen, did you wanna talk about the resources available um, and the links on Seniors Blue Book? Sure, so Seniors Blue Book um, is a national organization. So we have a large presence here in the Dallas area, but if you are watching from one of the other states, um, there are national resources available for you online as well. Um, and Seniors Blue Book does have a presence in 26 other markets. So I think that's really important to know. We have educational resources on there. We do educational events. You can go to our website and find all of those. Um, we have uh, resources. So for example, elder law attorneys, the Conversation Ready North Texas, 
um, resources, resources from the state. So the Texas Department of Health is on there. I mean, all kinds of resources to help you to navigate through um, these types of crises um, and, and finding care. If you're looking uh, for a place to, to place a loved one, um, we have those resources as well. So lots of good stuff on the website. Um, please go there, visit it, and kind of navigate through a little bit. And, and one other point, this, this came up in another webinar. If, if someone does have to go to the hospital, because we know they will be um, semi-quarantined, make sure that they do, um, if they're comfortable with it, to bring their phone or a tablet or a laptop and the charger, because that may be the only way you can contact each other. Um, and I've seen stories about how people want to actually leave a video for family members on their phone and the nurses are helping with that. But that's so important right now because it might be their only um, only way to contact. Um, and if you did have any of the paperwork, certainly in the legal paperwork, bring it. Any of, even, even if the starter kit you have it, just bring that sheet of paper. That, that would be better, as Susan said, better, better than nothing. Something is better than nothing and you can always make it legal later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So I just talked about the, uh, the mask that I uh, demo and video that I had put up on Facebook and shared that she used. That is actually available on our website as an educational piece as well. Um, there's an article and at the end of the article on making a mask is the video of how, you know, showing you it actually being made in two minutes or less. So um, make sure that you go on there and look at that too. Mm -hmm. So this slide has the link um, to the site at healthandhumanservicestexas.gov where you can find the Texas version, free version of these advanced directives. You can download a directive to physician, a medical power of attorney. They have a durable power of attorney for health, for, sorry, durable power of, financial power of attorney also. And then the out of hospital DNR form that is specific for Texas. That is something if, you, if someone wants an out of hospital, do not resuscitate order, that has to be on this one form. Um, there's nothing else that, that is legally binding in Texas. So that's something that has to be, that can be notarized, but then also has to be signed by the physician and then will become valid. But you can download any of those forms um, at this link or just go and search at healthandhumanservicestexas.gov and you can find those, those there. Susan, I have a question for you. That out of hospital DNR form, uh -huh. is the physician available, uh, able to sign that uh, digitally? I don't, I've not seen them sign it digitally. What I've seen is, is you you know you or your decision maker will fill it out, get it notarized, and then it goes to the physician um, via fax. Is how we used to do it when we did it in the nursing home or assisted living. We would fax it or electronically get it to them. They would hand sign it and then fax it back, and that was okay. It was okay to have a photocopied copy of it um, okay. for our use. So um, somebody else might have more about that but that's that's how we would do it I see I see a raised hand so let's see what they have to say oh um so the question is so does Texas not honor a post, post. no mm -hmm. the out-of-hospital DNR would be the only thing that you could do that would prevent someone from starting CPR outside of a hospital I am, okay, I see, if you have your hand raised, could you type your question in the Q&A part, Cheryl Akers, or comment, and we'll get it there. Awesome. All right, so next steps. You're all going to need to complete your evaluation form and indicate your uh, interest in future programs. Like and follow Seniors Blue Book, CareWorks, and Conversation Ready North Texas on Facebook to get updates. Have the conversation yourself and encourage others to talk about their wishes. Um, and we will take a few more questions if anyone has them. And while we are looking to see if there's more questions, Susan's gonna tell you about another program that's coming up. 
Ah, uh, yes. So if you have more questions about uh, legal issues specifically, of course, you can always reach out to me or to John McNair. We're happy to talk with any of you and, and answer specific um, questions or situations that come up. Not everything is cookie cutter. Uh, so sometimes that's better on a one on one basis, but we are um, holding a webinar similar to this next Thursday, same time, same back channel um, at three o'clock next Thursday. And we'll be talking specifically about estate planning during the pandemic and some of the implications and things that we need people. If you've got your documents, here's some specific things to look at at this document and things to talk to family about in terms of um, what you want, what you don't want. Um, and, and making sure you're setting things up for the best outcome. So um, if you go to our Facebook page, um, John McNair Facebook page, then you can see the link to this um, and it's on Eventbrite. So we'll, we'll be posting it on all the usual channels. So I hope to, to chat with some of you there. Awesome. Thank you so much to uh, both of our panelists today. Uh, Susan Rogers with McNair Dallas Law. You want to wave there, Susan? Thanks, everybody. Lori Miller with Apple Care and Companion and Conversation Ready North Texas. Thanks, everybody. We're glad you're here. Yes. Um, we do have one more comment in the Q&A. Um, Cheryl Akers, um, she says that that um, there is a Texas MOST form that combines the out-of-hospital DNR information along with a lot of good information about choices for care, much more than advanced directives. That's great. Thank you, Cheryl. Maybe um, if you could send us the link to that, we could put it in our follow-up information as well. So thank you for sharing that. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for attending today. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us. I'm Kathleen Warshawski with Seniors Blue Book, um, Aging 2.0 Dallas and CareWorks, and uh, love that you all came and attended. We look forward to hosting more of these programs for you as we are social distancing. So please be watching for those and share them with your friends. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye.